it'd be uh, amazing to just talk about what it takes with robotic arms or in general, the whole process of how to build the life form, stuff you've done in the past, maybe stuff you're doing now, how to use bacteria, it's kind of synthetic biology, how yeah. to grow stuff yeah. by leveraging bacteria. Is there examples from the past? And yes, explain? and just take a step back over the 10 years, uh, the Mediated Matter Group, which was my group at MIT, um, has sort of dedicated itself to, bio-based design would be a suitcase word, but th sort of thinking about that synergy between nature and culture, biology and technology. And we attempted to build a suite of embodiments, let's say, that they ended up in amazing museums and amazing shows. And, and we wrote patents and papers on them, but they were still N of ones. Mm -hmm. Again, the challenge, as you say, was to grow them. And we classified them into fibers, cellular solids, biopolymers, pigments. And in each of the examples, although the material was different, sometimes we used fibers, sometimes we used silk with silkworms and honey with bees and or comb as the structural material. With vespers, we used synthetically engineered bacteria to produce pigments. Although the materials were different and the hero organisms were different, the philosophy was always the same. The approach was really an approach of computational templating. That templating allowed us to create templates for the natural environment where nature and technology could duet, could dance uh, together to create these products. So just as a few examples with the silk pavilion, we've had a couple of pavilions uh, made of silk and the second one, uh, which was the bigger one, which ended up at the Museum of Modern Art with my friend and incredible mentor, Paola Antonelli, that pavilion was six meter tall and mm -hmm. it was produced by silkworms. And and there we had um, different types of templates. There were physical templates that were basically just these water soluble meshes upon which the silkworms were mm -hmm. spinning. And then there were environmental templates, which was a robot basically applying a variation of environmental conditions such as heat and light to guide the movement of the silkworm. You're saying so many amazing things and I'm trying not to interrupt you, but like <laughs> one of the things you've learned by observing, by doing science on, on these is that the environment defines the shape that they create or contributes or intricately plays with the shape they create. And so like, and you get to, that's one of the ways you can get to guide their work is by uh, defining that environment. By the way, you said hero organism, which is an epic term. <laughs> so that, that means like, is whatever is the biological living system that's, uh, doing the creation. And that's what's happening in pharma and, and, and biomaterials and, by the way, precision ag and, 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 and food, new food design technologies as people are betting on a hero organism is the sort of how I think term. of it. <laughs> and, 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 and the hero organism is sometimes it's the palm oil or, or it's, uh, it's the mycelium. There's a lot of mushrooms around uh, for good and bad. And, and it's cellulose or it's, you know, fake bananas or the, the workhorse E. coli. But these hero organisms are being betted on as like the, what's the one answer that solves everything? <laughs> Hitchhiker's Guide? 42. 42. Yeah. These are sort of the 42s of, of, you know, of the enchanted new universe. And back at, at MIT, we said, instead of betting on all of these organisms, let's approach them as almost like movement in a symphony and let's kind of lean into what we can learn from each of these organisms in the context of building a project in an architectural scale. And those usually were pavilions. And then the computational templating is the way you guide the work of this, how many did you say, 17,000? 17,532. So each of these silkworms threads are about you know one, one mile. Yeah. Um, in distance and 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 they're they're beautiful and when and just thinking about the amount of material you know it's a bit like thinking about the you know the the length of capillary vessels that grow in your belly when you're pregnant to feed that incredible new life form um it, it's just nature is amazing but back to the silkworms I, I think i had three months um to build this incredible pavilion but um we couldn't figure out how, we were thinking of emulating the process of how a silkworm goes about building its incredible architecture, this cocoon mm -hmm. over the period of 24 to 72 hours. And it builds a cocoon basically to protect itself. It's, mm -hmm. it's a beautiful form of architecture and it uses pretty much just two 
materials, two chemical compounds, sarsen and um, fibrin. The sarsen is sort of the glue of, of the cocoon. The fibrin is the, the fiber base material of the cocoon and through fibers and glue. And that's true for so many systems in nature, mm -hmm. lots of fiber and glue. And that architecture allows them to metamorphosize. And in the process, they vary the properties of that silk thread. So it's stiffer or softer depending on where it is in the section of the cocoon. And so we were trying to emulate this robotically uh, with a 3D printer that was a six-axis KUKA arm, one of these baby KUKAs. And we we're trying to emulate that process computationally and build something very large when one of my students now, um, an, a brilliant industrial engineer, ro roboticist on my team, Marcus, uh, said, well, you know, we were just playing with those silkworms and enjoying their presence when we realized that if they're placed on a desk or a horizontal surface, they will go about creating their cocoon. Only the cocoon would be flat um, because they're constantly looking for a vertical post in order to use that post as an anchor to spin the cocoon. But in the absence of that post, on surfaces that are less than 21 millimeters mm -hmm. and flat, they will spin flat patches. Mm -hmm. And we say, aha, let's work with them uh, to produce this, uh, this dome uh, as a set of flat patches. And a silkworm, mind you, is, uh, is quite an egocentric creature. Um, mm -hmm. and, and actually, the furthest you go, you move forward in evolution by natural selection, the more um, egoism you find in creatures. Um, so when you think about termites, right, they, uh, the, their material sophistication is, mm -hmm. is, is actually very primitive but they have incredible ability to communicate and connect with each other. So if you think about the entire, all of, na all of nature, let's say all of living systems as like a matrix that runs across two axes. One is material sophistication, which is terribly relevant for designers. And the other is communication. Um, uh, the, the termites ace on communication, but their material sophistication is crap, right? It's just saliva and feces and some soil particles that are built to create these incredible termite mounds at the scale that when compared to human skyscrapers, transcend all of buildable scales, uh, at least at, in, in, in terms of what we have today in architectural practice, just in, relative to the size of the termite. But when you look at the silkworm, the silkworm has zero connection and communication across silkworms. They were not designed to connect and communicate with each other. They're they're sort of a, a human design species because the the uh, the domesticated silk moth uh, creates the cocoon. Uh, we then produce the silk uh, of it, and then it dies. Um, so the, it has dysfunctional wings. It cannot fly. It's not so. So and and that's another problem that the sericulture um, industry has is what, why did we in the first place author this organism four thousand years ago that is unable to fly and is just there um, to basically live as um, to serve a human need which is textiles and so here we, we were fascinated by the computational kind of biology dimension of silkworms. But along the way, by the way, this is great. I never get to tell the full story. I'm, I'm so enjoying great. this so much. <laughs> <laughs> I always, I'm always like people say, I always speak in Nietzschean uh, paragraphs. They're way too long. And this is wonderful. This is like heaven. <laughs> Nietzschean <laughs> paragraphs. <laughs> you dropped um, me so many good lines. I love but, it. Okay. But, but, but really those, uh, those silkworms are not, yes, they're not designed to be like humans, right? They're not designed to connect, communicate, and build things that are bigger than themselves through connection and communication. So what happens when you had 17,000 of them communicating effectively? That's, that's a really great question. What happens is that at some point, the templating strategies, and as you said correctly, there were geometrical templating, material templating, environmental templating, chemical templating, if you're using pheromones to guide the movement of bees in the absence of a queen, where you have so a robotic cool. queen. Uh -huh. um, robotic but, queen. But whenever you have these templating strategies, you have sort of control over nature, right? But the question is, is there a world in which we can move from templating, from providing these computational material and immaterial uh, physical and molecular platforms that guide nature, almost like guiding a product, almost like a gardener, um, to a problem or an opportunity of emergence where that biological organism assumes agency 
by virtue of accessing the robotic code and saying, now I own the code, I get to do what I want with this code. Let me show you what this pavilion may look like or this product may look like. And I think one of the exciting moments for us is when we realized that these robotic platforms that were designed initially as templates actually inspired, if 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 I may, a kind of a collaboration and cooperation between silkworms that are uh, not a swarm-based organism. They're not like the bees and the termites. They don't work together and they don't have, you know, social orders amongst them, the queen and the drones, etc. They're they're all this the same in a way, right? And and here uh, what was so exciting for us is that these computational and fabrication technologies enable the silkworm to uh, sort of to to kind of hop <laughs> hop from from the branch in ecology of 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 worms to the branch in ecology of maybe human like intelligence where they could connect and communicate by virtue of you know feeling or rubbing against each other in in an area that was hotter or colder and they were so the product that we got at the end the variation of density of fiber and the distribution of the fiber and the transparency the product at the end seems like it was produced by a swarm silk community. Mm -hmm. But of course it wasn't. It's a bunch of biological agents working together to assemble this thing. That's really, really fascinating to us. How can technology um, um, augment or enable a swarm-like behavior in creatures that have not been designed uh, to work as swarms? So how do you construct a computational template from which uh a certain kind of thing emerges. So how can you predict what emerges, I suppose? So if you can predict it, it doesn't count as emergence. Actually, <laughs> I mean... <laughs> That's a deeply poetic line. We can talk about uh, it. I mean, it's a bit like it's kind of it doesn't count. Um, that's right, right. <laughs> Speaking of emergence, an empowerment because we're constantly uh, uh, um, moving between those as if they're equals in the, on the team. And one of them, Christoph, shared with me a mathematical equation for what does it mean to empower nature and what does empowerment in nature look like. Mm-hmm. Um, and that relates to emergence, and we can go back to emergence in a few moments. But I, I want to, I want to say it so that I know that I've learned it. <laughs> <laughs> and if I've Love learned this. it, I can use it later. Yeah, um, and maybe you'll figure something out as you say it. Of course, also. <laughs> of course, Christoph is the master here. But emergence. but really, um, we were thinking again: what does nature want? Nature wants. Um, nature wants uh, to increase the information dimension and reduce entropy. Um, what do we want? We kind of want the same thing. We want more, but um, we want order, right? And this goes back to your conversation with Yosha about stochastic versus deterministic languages or processes. His definition or the definition he found um, was that an agent is empowered if the entropy of the distribution of all of its states is high, while the entropy of the distribution of a single state given a choice, given an, an action, is low. Meaning it's that kind of uh, um, yeah, duality between opportunity, like starting like this and going like this, opening and closing. And, and, and this really, I think, is analogous to, to human empowerment. Mm-hmm. Given an mm-hmm. um, infinite wide array of choices, what is the choice that you make? Uh, to, you know, to 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 enable to empower, uh, to provide you with with the agency that you need. And how much does that making that choice actually control the the trajectory of the system? That's really nice. So this this applies to all the kinds of systems you're talking about. Yeah, and the cool thing is it it can apply to a human on an individual basis, but or a silkworm or a bee um, or a microbe, um, a microbe that has agency or by virtue of, 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 of a template. Um, but it also applies to a community of, of organisms like the bees. Um, and so we've done a lot of work sort of moving from, you've asked how to grow things. So we've grown things uh, using um, co-fabrication where we're digitally fabricating with other organisms that live across the various kingdoms of life and, and those were silkworms and bees. 
And uh, and with bees, um, which we've sent to outer space and returned healthily, and they were reprodu- reproductive. Okay, you're gonna have to tell that story. <laughs> you're gonna have to t- talk about the robotic queen and the pheromones. Come on. Like, um, so right. we built what we called a synthetic apiary, and the synthetic apiary was designed uh, as an environment that was a perpetual spring environment for the bees of Massachusetts. They go in hibernation, of course, during the winter season, um, and then we lose 80% of them or more uh, during that period. We were thinking, okay, what if we created this environment where um, before you template, right, before you can design with, you have to de- design for, right? You have to create this space of mutualism, space of sort of shared connection between you and the organism. And with bees, it started as the synthetic apiary. And we have proven that that curated environment where we design the space with high levels of control of temperature, humidity, and light, and we've proven that they were um, reproductive and alive. And we realized, wow, this environment that we created uh, can help augment bees in the winter season in any city around the world uh, where where bees survive and thrive in the summer and spring seasons? And could this be a kind of a new urban typology, an architectural typology of symbiosis, of mutualism between organisms and humans? Where these, or- by the way, the synthetic apiary was in a co-op in, you know, nearby Somerville. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had, you know, we had robots. Our team, you know, schlepped there every day with our with our tools and machines, and, and we made it happen. And the neighbors were very happy, and, and they got to get a ton of honey at the end of the winter. And and those bees, of course, were released into the wild at, at the end of the winter, alive and kicking. So then, in order to actually experiment with, with the robotic queen and idea or concept, yep. uh, we had to prove, obviously, that we can create this space for uh, for bees. And then after that, we had this amazing opportunity to send the bees to space on Blue Shepherd mission that is part of Blue Origin. And we, of course, said, yes, we'll take a slot. We said, okay, can we outdo NASA? So NASA in 1982 had an experiment where they sent bee, bees to to outer space. Uh, the bees returned. They were not reproductive. And um, and some of them died. And, and we thought, well, is there a way in which we can create a life support system, almost like a small mini biolab of a queen and her retinue mm-hmm. um, that would be sent in this uh, Blue Origin New Shepherd mission uh, in this one cell. And, and so that's, if the synthetic apiary was an architectural project, in this case, this second synthetic apiary was a product. It was, right, so from an, from an architectural controlled environment to a product scale controlled environment. And this bio lab, uh, this life support system for bees, was designed to provide the bees with all the conditions that they needed. And and we looked at that time at the Nasanov pheromone that the queen uses to guide the other bees. And we looked uh, at uh, pheromones that are associated with a bee and thinking of those pheromones being released inside the capsules that go, the capsule that goes to outer space. They returned um, back to our the media lab roof and those bees were alive and kicking and reproductive uh, and you know and they continued to create comb and and it ended with a beautiful nature paper that the team and I published together we gave them gold nanoparticles and silver nanoparticles because we were interested if if bees recycle wax it was known f- forever that bees do not recycle the wax and by feeding them these gold nanoparticles, we were able to prove that um, that the bees actually do recycle the wax. The reason I'm bringing this forward is because we don't view ourselves as designers of consumable products and, and, and architectural environments only, but we love that moment where these technologies, and by the way, every one of these projects that we created um, involve the creation of a new technology, whether it be a glass printer or the spinning robot or or the um, life support system for for the bee colony. They all involved a technology that was associated with the, the the project. And I never ever 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 want to let that part go because I love love technology so much. Um, and but but also another element of this is that always these projects, if they're great, they reveal new knowledge about or new science about um, 
the topic that that you're investigating, be it you know uh, silkworms or or bees or or glass. That's why I say I always tell my team it should be at MoMA and the cover of Nature or Science at the same time. We don't separate between the art and the science. It's 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 one of the same. 